first thing first is to strengthen the protection upon the property rights, especially intellectual property rights, to make sure that in Asia we create a, a very strong and solid environment to support such a change. And uh, you, you can never forget that because by the end of the day, Asian people should realize that whatever the world throw at you, just a cool body. And we, that is the way to do uh, today's business in Asia. I just uh, want to stop here and leave the room for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Liu. Uh, is that ready? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am grateful to Andrew and Victor for inviting me to this event. It has been very enlightening. It's a historic event, I believe. Uh, with regard to the new Asian financing architecture, I will present what I consider to be the issues for the research agenda at three levels global, regional, and national. At a global level, Asia has to contribute to the changing global financial architecture. It is bound to change. And Asia has to play a more active role in the future. At the same time, Asia has to adjust to the global financial architecture as it evolves. It's not that it dictates. So in that, I agree with uh, Paul's position yesterday, Mr. Palwar's position, that the most important is the international monetary system. Uh, our international monetary non-system. So you have one reserve currency dominating the world, which is not subject to any global rules, which is not subject to market discipline, and therefore it is a non-system. The debate is, what do you do with it? One approach is you can say, don't have it. Then are you going to have another single currency? If there is another single currency, then problems should normally be similar. Or is it going to be multiple currencies? And if it's multiple currencies, then you have the problem of externalities and inevitably to, to, to go towards one, uh, basically the nature of global trade being what it is, at least that should be considered. What's the scope for multiple currencies to coexist multiple reserve currencies? And the third issue is that would you have an SDR, and SDR is a unit of account, and in the final settlement you require a currency. Unless SDR becomes a global currency and IMF becomes a market maker. And then you have the whole issue of global governance. Okay, we want to have a global currency, good, have a global currency, which means you require a global monetary authority. My problem is that if there's global authority exists and it fumbles, the whole humanity suffers. So maybe it is better to have a messy non-system than a strong global monetary system with the risk of collapse the whole world. But my point is that that we have to look at this at the bottom. Current state of affairs, no good. Better state, look for it. We don't know. Two, more realistically, and I find in the agenda, the scope for uh, Asian currencies to become internationalized. Is, reserve, is internationalization same as reserve currency? What are the advantages of reserve currency? What are the disadvantages of reserve currency? For the country, for the region, for the world. We cannot view it as an emotional sense. And it's a new type of global situation that we are going, not what it was 20, 30 years ago for a variety of reasons. So I think we have to be, at least now coming to India, my own hunch, subject to whatever the results is, that I would not recommend to India that you should try to get over reserve currency at all. At least not for quite some time to come, for a variety of reasons. But I think the research will have to address this issue uh, squarely. So that, I would say, is one aspect of the group. Second uh, is the uh, financial, uh, but the other way, which I think has started already, is what we may call, you have um, different shades of non-system. And in the non-system, you have mechanisms like in the, uh, the increasing the role of local currencies, like what uh, uh, N, Remnant, the agreement. So you, you, you minimize 
the trade and other aspects from the vicissitudes of the global non system. So you have multiple channels uh, of protecting yourself. So, so maybe that, that's something that you should pursue. Second, with regard to the global financial architecture and the global financial institutions that you have, IMF and World Bank, uh, I think it is very clear that there will be a shift in the balance, and which means not only that uh, Asia will have a greater say, Asia will have a greater responsibility uh, in that sense for, the, for the, the global financial system. And this has to be carefully negotiated. And then we have G20, about which there are a lot of hopes, but if you see the record, I think it's a classic case of diminishing returns from the beginning. So meeting after meeting, there's less and less uh, achievement and more and more hope, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, now we come to the Financial Stability Board. I think Financial Stability Board is still drafting a lot more as a reaction to what has happened than a longer term perspective. And what, what is Basel III? How does Basel III contribute to growth? And for many of us, growth is as important as stability or social cohesion. So maybe we'll have to go beyond Basel III for the longer term if we are looking at the structural factors and the factors like the interaction between real and finance. And now as far as um, India's role here is concerned, I think India has given uh, its, uh, its own problems, its significant problems of poverty uh, within the country uh, and the need for significant growth. Plus, it tends to be a little more um, domestic demand driven, domestic supply driven. So it will perhaps definitely be to be influential, but I won't say that it will be quote unquote powerful in that sense. But it will have to play a very responsible role both in Asia and globally. Uh, but I think uh, the good thing that has happened uh, is uh, the, the type of uh, multiple uh, initiatives uh, that have been taken uh, in the global area now with Chiang Mai initiative. Uh, I think that will also create uh, certain stabilizing factors if we accept that fundamental changes uh, may not be easy to bring about uh, because of the essential uh, issues. And here we go to the regional level. I think that when it comes to the regional level, the most important lessons we have to learn is from Eurozone. The most important lesson, and Howard has explained very well, is the linkage between monetary, finance, and fiscal. There should be a virtual convergence of these three authorities, or these three policies. And you have to look at the sovereign situation with the balance. So we cannot, the, the contribution of financial sector uh, will depend on the macroeconomic environment. And the macroeconomic environment very much depends on the national public policies. So therefore, uh, I would say that financial integration, one has to be very careful with regard to currency integration and financial integration is the lesson from the Eurozone. Whereas there are huge benefits through integration of trade and integration and foreign investments, FDI in particular. I think that's one lesson I would take. So what, what does it mean for Asia with regard to regional arrangements? One, concentrate on trade finance. Two, concentrate on foreign direct investment. Three, you have uh, so regional um, uh, surveillance, uh, regional exchange information, regional cooperation among monetary authorities, which is slightly different. Uh, that means you reinforce uh, the regional framework within which the national policies are conducted. And here, uh, Indian position, in my view, analytically, the, the Indian position is that its capacity to integrate into the regional level and the global level is constrained by two factors. The fiscal position is so difficult to manage, it makes itself highly vulnerable. And second, there's a financial repression to take care of the fiscal dominance. So till such time we resolve the fiscal dominance and the financial repression, we'll not be able to proceed with integration of the rest of the world, uh, assuring uh, stability. So I think these are the fundamental uh, issues which, and in terms of vulnerability to shocks, uh, India is pretty vulnerable to several shocks. Uh, 
both on current account and capital account. Uh, on current account, and we have the food, possible shock to the food, to the fuel, as I mentioned, fiscal, financial, and external flows, the, the volatile flows are quite large. So in a way, therefore, uh, Indian growth story will be very much dominated while there will be getting to the large size. There will be increasing integration and increasing presence, both at the corporate level and at the financial sector level. The growth will be significantly driven by the, uh, by the way the vulnerabilities are handled. But in terms of fundamentals, I think it, it has strong fundamentals. The household sales are almost on par with China. Uh, the savings and investment levels are high. The innovation, uh, the, the basic innovation uh, is um, strong. And productivity increases are, by and large, uh, quite uh, impressive. So uh, in a way, I would say that uh, Indian, Indian contribution in the global economy will be, uh, will be gradual and will depend much, very much on the way its fist is, is maintained. Now, how does the uh, Asian financial architecture contribute to the net uh, to the national level policies? Uh, I think there uh, we have to learn from, uh, we have learned a lot from the Asian crisis, most of us, but now we have to learn from the finance, global financial crisis. What are the lessons? One, avoid excessive financialization. And what is excessive financialization? In fact, even more recently, there have been studies by BIS also. Uh, and also avoid excessive leverage. And leverage on all the four balance sheets. One has to look at it, not one. That is the government balance sheet, the household balance sheet, the corporate balance sheet, the financial sector balance sheet. So the excessive credit, excessive leverage, and excessive financialization. So what is excessive? That's where the problem is. We know that we are far away from excessive, but we have to make sure that we don't trust job. And the, the work of the global financial uh, architecture reform institute should really be able to contribute for a greater understanding of what I call optimal financialization and minimizing the complexity uh, of the financial uh, innovations. And Canada provides a fairly good example of using the, perhaps the most balanced approach to financial sector regulation. And in terms of overall objectives, I think one thing which we have to learn from both American, both the US, uh, UK uh, experience and perhaps UK experience is we have to aim at inclusive finance. I make a distinction between inclusive finance and financial inclusion. Financial inclusion is that you are trying to bring in people who are outside finance. No, the finance itself should be designed that is inclusive, and w w which means the financial services to be, should be accessible to all, affordable to all, and 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 and, and variety of obligations can be put which include financing to SMEs. And um, finally, um, uh, in some ways, one could look at, given the significant common factors, uh, some sort of a standards of disclosure, standards of code of finance. Uh, and Andrew himself had presided over standards and codes, you know, for this in place at some stage. And I think we can lead this exercise and give, if we include sort of code of ethics for various participants, not just the regulators, whether it's credit rating agencies, whether it's stock exchanges, some sort of code of ethics, standards of governance. And I think that's where the, the Fund Institute will be able to provide a significant contribution. And I will not stop here. The only thing I want to say here is you must have read the recent book by Schiller on finance and good society. So I just thought, that the ideal book should be a good finance and society. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mary. With uh, still two speakers to go, I think with all the suggestions that have been made, uh, Andrew, I think you have more than, your work more than cut out for you in terms of the suggestions. <laughs> Next, uh, we'll come to uh, Mr. Saito, please. Well, uh, Looking back to the, uh, the uh, there's a uh, real uh, reason why the Iran state uh, facing this uh, financial crisis. Uh, I think uh, all uh, this advanced uh, state has uh, suffered the uh, shortage of uh, demand uh, because uh, we or they have made a crucial effort to increase the productivity or introduction of the uh, new uh, production system. Uh, very ironically, 
uh, that made up the uh, excessive uh, products all over the world. So governments are forced to make the artificial demand. Uh, that is the reason why the, even the Wall Street or wherever it is uh, try to make the uh, intentionally the uh, leveraged finance or uh, securitization, whatever it is. Um, then uh, finally the state itself, that must have been the last result uh, having the uh, non performing loan. It can be very dangerous uh, risk matters. We, we have a lot of lessons in the case of the United States as well as Europe, I think. So how Asia should respond or uh, set up the uh, for future uh, business is that the, uh, still I think that uh, uh, we should uh, respect the uh, uh, market mechanism. This uh, advanced state uh, seems to be the, to, to uh, respected, uh, uh, have respected the uh, market mechanism, but uh, the reality is that they ignore the uh, market functions. Regardless of the uh, response or reaction from the market, uh, they continuously issue the uh, aiding uh, papers and distribute it. That was the reason why we are now uh, in the traps. In, in the Asia, uh, SME is a key, I think. Even in the United States uh, or any country, SME is the key. Uh, uh, in the United States recently, the, uh, by the name of JOBS, J-O-B-S, new uh, uh, rule are uh, enacted uh, in order to finance for the SME. So in Asia, the most SME are financed by the banks. Uh, to some extent that is okay, but uh, I think uh, uh, in order to smooth out the uh, uh, flow of funds uh, to these uh, profitable SMEs, uh, we have better think of the two ways. One is uh, naturally the uh, fixed income uh, sub issue, issuance, and another one is equity. As for the uh, fixed income, as you may know already a long time, the uh, uh, Asian Development Bank uh, other than uh, projections. Uh, they said uh, the, uh, the ABMI, the uh, Asian bond market uh, uh, initiatives, uh, has been long underway. So uh, we are better uh, take advantage of their facilities uh, to promote the uh, primary insurance as well as the uh, secondary market uh, trading, uh, if possible. And uh, as for the equity, uh, the Asian market uh, already enjoying the uh, quite uh, uh, reasonable or sizable uh, equity market, uh, and particularly in the uh, Southeast Asian state uh, the areas, the uh, Singapore and uh, uh, Malaysia uh, already uh, made up a sign uh, to make the uh, uh, joint, joint market or so. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we have already uh, in the equity market the uh, uh, regional exchange federation by the name of uh, AOSEF, it is including the Asian all countries and Oceania uh, stock exchange federation. So, uh, we have better uh, use, take advantage of this uh, federation uh, to set up the uh, some common rule harmonized rule uh, in these uh, regions with a very much uh, a different way with, from the uh, uh, Western society. That means, I think, uh, with a much more high uh, uh, nobility of the virtue or moral sense in mean, the finance is more important. I think uh, Asian people can share the value or meanings of the uh, business or financial uh, functions. Uh, which is not only for the sake of the money maker, but greedy money chasers. Rather, our mission is to provide the uh, uh, healthy fund to the uh, uh, SME or whoever it is, entrepreneurs, uh, with the uh, very high morale, and that is uh, very important. So, uh, I would like to propose that the uh, in these Asian religions, the, uh, uh, there should not be a welfare 
standardized uh, consultations of uh, uh, market uh, rather than a way that seeks to build soft alliances through uh, mutual competition and uh, sophistication uh, based on common sense of values. Uh, uh, that is uh, that is a very uh, possible uh, acknowledging uh, unique histories and culture and the differences in the uh, economic structure and each state uh, national regulation. Uh, so uh, I think these uh, soft uh, uh, alliance uh, will be suited to Asian market. So again, I'd like to say uh, we should share. Uh, common ideas, established rules unique to these regions, and uh, build market in the uh, uh, conservative and efficient way. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, we can be of assist uh, in things, uh, uh, already we made up a uh, professional fixed income market in Japan, uh, or uh, European, some banks are uh, financing there. Uh, also, we relax uh, totally the uh, regulations, language, accounting standard, or corporate governance standard uh, for the sake of the uh, uh, SME group or Asian uh, corporations. So, uh, we like to collaborate with the whole uh, friend exchange in this area. That's my opinion. Thank you, Sato. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Found Institute for inviting me to come to this conference uh, to provide me the opportunity to learn from uh, experts from all over the world and uh, the fellow panelists uh, to better understand the financial crisis and how we should move forward. And also, it is a great learning experience for me, um, particularly the past the session, because we, uh, CSRC, is just about to launch our own think tank, the Beijing Institute of uh, Securities and uh, Futures. So we would like to learn from the Fund Global Institute on how to build and run a global leading think tank. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you some of our thoughts on how we should learn from the crisis and what's going on in the Chinese capital markets. Uh, first, of, first, on the crisis. I think we can learn a great deal from the, the past two crises, one in the US, um, one in the in the Europe, and I think a lot of consensus has been already been reached in the global community, uh, such as uh, financial industry should serve the real economy instead of playing just playing money game of itself, and uh, also, for example, we we we, uh, we should pour, we should pay more attention to systemic risks and. Uh, and other risks as well. I mean, the, we just, the, the JP Morgan uh, incident just showed that uh, how hard it is to gorge, uh, to assess more risks and to contain uh, and stay disciplined. Um, and I think it's all, we also learned from the crisis that we need to enhance regulatory coordination or collaboration as the markets, is getting, the markets are getting more and more integrated and the regulation is still still stays within borders. Uh, however, I think we have to be very careful uh, when we try to uh, draw lessons from the crisis, uh, which happened in advanced markets. And it's also dangerous just to adopt those uh, lessons and apply them to emerging markets. Uh, I don't. I'm not expert on other Asian markets. I can just take China as one example. Uh, Chinese markets very much different from the advanced markets in two aspects. Uh, first, it has very short history, uh, less than 22 years, uh, whereas in most of the advanced markets uh, have more than 200 years of history. And uh, the secondly, Chinese market is very much typical uh, top-down approach uh, versus like a bottom-up approach like the U.S. because um, we start from uh, the planning economy. Uh, so we really have to be very, very careful. For example, uh, in, we know that uh, there are too much uh, sophistication in financial products, or too many of them, were part of the reason for the crisis in the States, 
Of course, in China, uh, we have too many, uh, we don't have so many sophisticated, sophisticated products. We have just launched one uh, financial derivative, the index future, uh, two, three years ago. Uh, so there's a long way to go. Um, another point is that uh, we know that part of the reasons why uh, U.S. had a crisis in 2008 was the over leverage of financial institutions. Lehman Brothers had a leverage ratio of more than 140 uh, prior to the crisis, prior to its bankruptcy. Uh, in China, the securities firms has a, a leverage ratio of 1.3. Uh, so uh, it's merely just uh, there's basically no leverage at all. So it's that's another difference. Also, we have to know that. Uh, uh, in the a lot of the markets, like in the states, uh, over liberalization is probably the problem. But in China, liberalization is still the way to go. So I think uh, knowing all those differences, we we cannot just uh, simply come to a sim simple conclusion and being very uh, simplistic. Uh, I think uh, one thing uh, I personally think we can draw lesson from the uh, eurozone crisis is that uh, uh, I think. Uh, with the globalization, globalization, uh, the world has become flat, uh, and I think uh, every economy uh, or nation, uh, they have to re-examine its uh, own competitiveness, uh, meaning that uh, you you have to look carefully how you can um, weigh in this very much competitive and uh, integrated world. Uh, for a lot of for some of the European economies, uh, I think uh, in terms of labor cost. They are not so competitive with, I mean, China or India or Brazil. I mean, uh, in most of the sectors, Chinese labor cost is still like one tenth of the Europeans. So, on that and on that front, I think uh, Europe doesn't doesn't have competitive edge. On other front, um, the um, innovation, I think uh, it, it, I don't think it can compete with the states. Uh, therefore, I think uh, that, that can partially explain the the, the reason why. Uh, Three years uh, after the 2008 crisis, uh, I think the world is surprised to see that Europe is actually in bigger trouble than U.S. And uh, I think behind that, the reason behind that, uh, our understanding is that uh, the, the financial structure has some uh, influence uh, on the on the economic resilience and the recovery, uh, the speed of recovery. I think the states has a very much market driven or market-oriented financial system, and Europe uh, is very uh, good at commercial banks. Uh, China is similar to Europe. Our, in terms of fin financing, uh, our financing structure is very much like uh, uh, bank versus capital market, uh, 80 to 20, uh, similar in Europe, and the uh, US is just about the reverse. It's like 20 to 80. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we uh, you know, try to finish up so we can give time just, to the, uh, yeah. Sorry. Two minutes? Yeah, sure. Um, there, therefore, I think it's, 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 our, um, uh, it's our objective uh, and our uh, agenda to, to promote a uh, capital market in China. And I'm very, I'm very happy that Chairman Liu actually shared my uh, view on that. Uh, thanks to his leadership, uh, Chinese banks are very uh, healthy and robust. Uh, probably just the too robust, and uh, and well, that's a compliment. Uh, I think uh, uh, what was, what's going on in China right now uh, on, on top of our agendas, a uh, couple of things. Uh, number one, we try to build the on equity side. We try to build the we call it multi-layer um, capital market system. Meaning that we have uh, only the main board. We just as an example, the U.S. market is very much a pyramid structure. NYSC has twenty-three hundred companies. Nasdaq twenty-seven hundred. OTCBB plus pink sheet, which is the OTC market, has about nine thousand companies, and the gray market below that was sixty thousand. In China, the main board has more companies than the small and medium board, which has more company than the enterprise, the, the growth enterprises board. And which is bigger than the, the, the OTC market, which has only 115 listings. So we need to expand the, the OTC market. We're promoting the third and fourth board. And uh, in China, I'll give, you one, I'll give you some idea of what's going on in China. In Beijing, uh, the, company, the number of companies 
qualified for IPO uh, in Beijing alone uh, is more than 1,000. CSRC typically can approve uh, about 300 companies per year. And therefore, if we want to finish the task for Beijing, we need three and a half years. And we have 31 provinces. So this it just cannot meet the, the economic need. Secondly, we need to promote the bond market. Uh, in most uh, 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 markets,